Welcome to the Time Management Podcast with me, your host, Abigail Barnes. I'm a productivity coach, global speaker, time management author, and award-winning entrepreneur on a mission to share the 888 formula with the world and to remind you that it's your time. Leave it to me to bring you new time management tips, tricks, tools, and strategies to introduce you to guests, research, and case studies from around the world, and to give you a simple five-step process you can follow to up-level your productivity, achieve your goals, and create a life that exceeds your wildest dreams. I'm so excited that you're here, so let's get started. Welcome to the show. My guest today is the amazing Daniel Rowles. Daniel, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Good to be here. I'm so, so excited for this conversation. We are going to go all over the place talking time, talking AI, talking marketing, talking work-life balance. Let's dive straight in. Who is Daniel Rowles in a nutshell? He's CEO of a company called Target Internet. Target Internet is essentially a digital marketing training business that I founded 14 years ago. It's a great business to be in because essentially the world around us is changing so quickly. Our job as an organization is to try and keep people up to date with that. So we have an online learning platform, but how Abigail and I got to know each other was from speaking at similar events. And invariably, you'll be speaking about some sort of time management topic, and I'll be rabbiting on about AI and how to suck up all your time using all these different things. And I thought, actually, a conversation between the two of us can be quite interesting because one of the biggest challenges in what I do is is time. And it's that's the challenge that every kind of digital marketer is dealing with as well. So I've got lots of jump offs we'll get into with that. So day by day, running that business, public speaking um, and running the business. And then um, as well as that, I am a program director at Imperial College which means I head up digital marketing and digital transformation at the business school. So I do that on the master's program and the MBA programs. Uh, And then I do something called the Digital Marketing Podcast, which is uh, the global leading digital marketing podcast. now as well, about 150,000 people a month there. That that fills up most of my time. Trying to be a good dad to my much older kids now. So my daughter's 22 now and my son's 14. And spending life living in a tiny little island in Jersey off the coast of France, trying to work out that elusive work-life balance side of things. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. So exciting. Let's dive straight in then. What's your relationship been like with time over the years? What was it like back in the day? It's terrible and marginally better now. I think it's probably a good a good kind of summation. I used to run agencies. I studied computer science, fell into marketing at the right time to be in marketing because it was kind of having some technical knowledge was really useful. Then realize that the way the agency world works is that you have more clients, you have more staff, you have more clients, you have more staff. And it's an absolute cash flow nightmare of a business model. From a time management point of view, you're very much on yield management of how much you're getting from your team. And you're always operating at over 100% capacity. So you're doing everything on billable hours. You're selling your time, you're selling your team's time. And you always overstretched. And I hated it as a business model. I just I just really didn't enjoy it. I thought it was bad for the staff. The client, it wasn't great for because he who shouts the loudest is the one that got the attention. So it's it's a, a whole business model that's overselling time. That's that's what it's based on. I didn't like it. And I decided about uh, a number of times I was going to kind of exit and do my own thing. And eventually, 14 years ago, I kind of did that. And I I built into my contract where I was at the time that I could do a day a week doing my own thing. And I kind of figured if I could go off and do a day's consultancy or a day's training, that would almost be a salary. And therefore, I could go off and probably part company. And the the problem is, at that point, you make the decision of it, you know, it's time to leave, it's time to move on. It's always too late. You should have done it before. And the problem is, you're always at the point in your career, probably, where you're earning the most you've ever earned. It might not be that much money, but it's probably, you know, the high point so far in your career. So I, I had a job where I was earning more money than I'd ever earned before. And I was getting up when it was dark, going to work, commuting into London from Brighton at the time. And then coming back very late in the evening, never seeing my kids, stressed to the eyeballs the whole time, not enjoying it. So that's when I was like, right, now's the time. It's the time to transition to running my own organisation. If I could do a number of days consultancy or training, which is really what it started off as, 
then this could turn into a business. And that's all it was trying to be at the beginning, was trying to be a business to make a living, to improve my quality of time. Then a client came to me and said, if we wanted to have an online learning platform, could you could you provide us one? And we said, a group of us said, yeah, uh, give, us, give us a month and we'll build it. So we had this demand to build this thing. So we built the thing and that is kind of 13, 12, 13 years ago, what ended up being Target Internet. And Target Internet now is that online learning platform and it's the hub for our kind of community and all that kind of stuff as well. So, and it's evolved over a period of time. And I said my relationship with with time wasn't, you know, maybe a hundred percent. And the reason for that is we've always bootstrapped, i.e. we've grown the business with no investment. And that's absolutely crazy from a mental health and time management point of view because you're constantly just fighting to grow everything that little bit more and you've got no money to do it so you're having to do loads of jobs that you shouldn't be doing you should really hand it over to someone else but from another perspective your time is yours to manage so it's your choice at the end of the day you haven't got a board or a load of investors kind of hassling you um so i from my perspective that's that freedom really appealed to me so i don't this idea that you know if you've got lots of free time you're doing a good thing with your time management i think is an absolute myth i think the reality is am i as anywhere near as efficient as i can be and do i take time out for that i don't call it work-life balance but for my own well-being then i think Yes, there's there's a fairly decent level of control there. I think ex externally, if you looked at how busy I am, people would just go, I'm nuts busy, but I'm never stressed particularly. I'm not someone that it kind of gets on top of because I feel quite in control of it. There's something in there that means I'm doing a fairly okay job of it. I can always see room for improvement. There's a number of techniques that have got me there. Would you say that there was a pivotal moment in this journey, which I'm imagining made up of a, over a number of decades, a number of years, were there pivotal moments? And can you talk us through some of these? I, I definitely think that thing from going from having this best paid job to suddenly realizing how miserable I was and actually going, is this just this the path? And I, I think one of those pivotal moments is that I, once you get made a managing director of an organization, it means your next job is a managing director, generally speaking. And I realized I hated being managing director in that all you do is HR meetings and finance meetings. And I didn't feel like any of my time was spent doing the things I actually like doing. So that was massively pivotal. It's like, I don't want to be a managing director. Invariably, I then started my own business and ended up being the managing director of that. So the, the good thing about it was that I made myself CEO and I employed a managing director. And CEO is just free reign to go around doing the things that you want to do. For a company of our size, it's ridiculous to have a, a managing director and a CEO, but it, it's just the reality of actually, the MD runs the business on a day by day and does the finance and the HR and all the stuff that I don't like doing. And then I get to do the strategy and the content creation and those kind of things. So that, that was a very pivotal moment for me. The other one is that recently, if I took a more kind of granular look, I can fill my diary a 10 times over of doing, you know, public speaking or creating content or whatever it might be. And actually, it got to the point where so much stuff in my diary wasn't moving the needle. I was like, you know, responding to emails and going off to meetings and attending this and attending that. And actually, I took that step back again, like I had to a number of years ago and say, right, if I'm going to spend my time on stuff that really moves the needle, what, what should I be doing? What's the stuff that's really going to shift the organization and that I like doing? And that little Venn diagram of being able to focus on what I like doing and what's going to move the needle is probably something I try and revisit almost on a monthly basis now, just because it's very easy to drift otherwise. And it's really easy to end up spending loads of time on stuff that's really not achieving anything. feels like you're busy, but it's not really achieving very much. Um, and I think that in marketing, that's a really easy one to do. So I think that that was a real pivotal one for me. And it's something I do regularly now. Yeah, I think that's that whole efficiency and effectiveness. So we can be really, really efficient at the wrong thing um, and not effective at the things that are moving the needle. So just as some examples for the audience then, what would you say were things that you quite quickly identified on a monthly basis were necessary to evolve your business? And <laughs> for want of a better word, improve the cash flow there is some bits of my time where i'm actually i'm selling my time still which is not something i particularly like to do but you get it to a rate that's okay so if i am out 
delivering an in-company training session. I'm getting paid to do it. And that is non-negotiable. And the reality is I need to be somewhere present to do that. End of. That's that's absolutely fine. So there's a certain amount of my diary that, that can't be shifted. So that was that was the first thing that kind of goes in. Everything then gets arran- arranged around that to some extent. Then I would I would realize that I'd been sitting there, you know, responding to emails for how many hours a day that we end up kind of doing that and just all the admin that goes with that stuff. And the reality was that probably 90% of it was a waste of time. So from my perspective, that was then, okay, block that off. Classic kind of time management thing, but block it off, do it in blocks. Um, but in reality, get up and create something before I do anything else. So I'll talk about morning routines maybe in a minute. But the whole the whole piece for me is I have to get something out the door every day, whether that is an article I've written, a piece of e-learning I've created, um, a video that I've created, or anything else like that. And that that's each of those things is a fairly time consuming thing. So it will take multiple days to do it. But the rule is now I have to be getting something out the door each day and everything else needs to be deprioritized according to what's blocked out of my diary, but also what's going to actually get out the door. And the immediate impact of that is our search rankings start going through the roof. So we're getting more traffic to the website because we're actually publishing stuff. Um, the podcast grows and grows because the regularity and the frequency and all those kind of things, the research we're putting into it makes things grow. And our customers are happier because we're getting more online learning out the door as well. So it's very much one foot in front of the other. But by publishing and making publishing the thing, that's really shifted um, things for me as well. From a work life, and I don't like calling it work life balance because I don't think the two things should be seen as completely separate. But I think that actually, from a well being point of view, building exercise and that kind of stuff as a routine that it's not really avoidable is what what kind of works for me. And I see you do this all the time. You know, you're forever um, going to yoga, and that's kind of part of your daily routine, and that's something that kind of keeps you kind of well. And I think for me, I get up. I get kind of changed and I'm out the door of my dog. That for me is a big thing. That's like about 45 minutes and it's a proper hike. I mean, we're down rivers and all sorts of things every morning. So before I've even done anything or even had a chance to think about it, I've done about a 40, 45 minute hike. Then I get on my bike and I cycle to where my office is. And I purposefully don't work from home. I have an office, uh, a shared office space that we use in town. And that's about a 10K kind of cycle into town. So before I've even thought about it, I've done an hour and a half of exercise first thing in the morning. And that for me just gives me a bit of a base to work from. Cause I know by the time I get home, once I cycle back, then I, at the bare minimum, I've done the exercise, making it non-negotiable for myself. I know how much of a terrible, terrible procrastinator I am. Um, like a truly world-class procrastinator. So actually just removing the choice has been one of the most important things for me. The other real epiphany for me was, was this thing, which is just, this sits here all the time and it's just a journal, but it it's a journal that combines task planning with everything else. So it's the idea that I write down like, what are my priorities today and all that kind of stuff. There's a little panel for how was the last day and how do you feel about things? And you know, I can just brain dump things, but also it challenges me of like, what's going to be the work life balance? What's going to balance today out? And that might be going for a walk, it might be doing some exercise, but it could equally be just getting that thing out the door is going to make me feel a lot better. And for me, when my time management's better, I am happier, wildly happier. And I could have spent all day just working, not doing much well-being based kind of stuff. But in reality, I'm feeling a lot better because I've actually got stuff out the door. There's a there's a certain lack of natural complete to finish a tendency that I can overcome by being quite strict in that kind of time management approach to things. These are such great top tips here. I'm loving it. Can we dive into two things from this then? So one is, do you have a a strategy, a way of planning your diary? Um, And if so, can you talk us through that? And then the second thing is, leading off of that you 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 touched on your morning routine so let's sort of combine the morning routine in with all of that as well we work with our clients and therefore if there is a project kind of scheduled in i will be in certain locations at certain times so the first thing that's going in is the team that and the team are managing my diary from this point of view as well so that they are going in and dropping in right a client needs you in next month what days can we do so logistically that's kind of blocking out maybe um two days a week 
the rule of thumb is I can't do more than two days a week of that stuff. Because if you do, everything else tends to fall. Now that doesn't always work because commercial needs are commercial needs. But so that that's the first thing. So the team know, try and cluster things together, try not to put two days per week in to do something. And if there's travel, make it logical that I leave, I'm away for a couple of days and then I come back. Because it tends to be I go and stay in London for probably two days a week and then I'm maybe somewhere else. And for me, there's there's two stages. There's the the kind of monthly planning, which is the going in and just arranging everything else around that, but to quite a granular level of detail. So we will have a content calendar that says what are we publishing in when, what podcasts, what videos, what articles, and they get scheduled into my diary and the diary time gets blocked out. So if I know it's going to make, take me roughly five or six hours to write something, I've, I've blocked that time out in the diary. Uh, and that that shouldn't be shifted around with the podcast we do a podcast every week but we block record them every six weeks so everyone comes to the studio here we physically kind of record them together and we'll do six episodes back to back so we'll then kind of release those gradually over that period of time as well so always trying to do things in an efficient way as possible um and then everything else within the diary then can can fit in as it kind of needs to but those big actions are kind of creative time is blocked out then every evening I plan out classic one again every plan out what you're going to do the next day it goes into the journal I come in and I work through the journal the next day but the journal is open on the desk previous comments about the previous day all done and my plan for the day is in there that for me gives me huge mental clarity because the problem is otherwise I get really really easily distracted email is obviously the biggest one for that and I I've never quite overcome that properly, I don't think. I can think learn a bit from you, Abigail, on that. Um, so we'll discuss that. But I think the reality is that just by that process of having it written down ready for me, that makes a huge difference. The morning routine is up at six, alarm goes off at six, get out of bed. I'm literally shaved, all the clothes are laid out. Um, I've got to that stage now, ready for that. And the, the, the complicated thing about this is there's multiple locations and clothing changes involved. So it's get up, get the dog gear on. Invariably, it's going to be wet. Um, at this time of the year, it's also pitch black at six o'clock in the morning still. So it's head torch on, high vis on, out with the dogs. Dogs are in high vis, uh, walking through the woods in the pitch black, which is quite a lot of fun, um, especially for the dogs. 45 minutes get beta. The sun's coming up at that point. Change over into the cycling stuff, but make sure I've got my work clothes with me jump on the bike, cycle 10k, which is really nice cycle, it's like down a, for a stream and along the beach. Uh, and then get to the office, get changed into something a little bit smarter, uh, and then be ready for the day ahead, probably sitting here ready to work at 7.30. So I've then got about an hour, an hour and a half in the morning, at least to get a block of work done. I don't look, email doesn't get looked at at that point, get that block of work done. Then I give myself half an hour email triage. I've got half an hour normally before I start any meetings, like a 9.30 or anything else, to just triage anything that comes in. And then the day kind of progresses, depending on what's blocked into my diary. But I've found I'm, I'm not naturally an early riser. I'm naturally incredibly lazy. But what I found is if the alarm goes off early, I get straight out of bed, that works. If I snooze once, I'm done. That's it. I'm just absolutely doomed. So for me, it's just the alarm goes off and I get up and I don't even think about it. Um, and I remember reading about this like 15 years ago and thinking, oh, I wish I could be one of those people. And it just force of habit of just setting the alarm and getting up for something I'm getting has made a world of difference to me. Um, and I just feel like by, by doing that, by the time I'm sitting at my desk, I've already had a fairly productive day because I've done a load of exercise. So I kind of feel in a good mindset by that point as well. So that really helps me because I know most of it's about managing my own head. So I think from that point of view, it makes a, it makes a big difference. There's three things there that I heard you say. The first one is that you have a schedule, have a diary, have the things that you know need mm. to, to be done, like the immovable objects, if you like. The second thing that I heard you say is that you are planning the night before. So many people that I speak to say, I get in and, and, and I'm looking through my to-do list or I'm writing my to-do list the power of knowing what it is that you're going to do is what makes you more productive. So I heard you say yeah. that, which is fantastic. And then the third thing that I heard you say in and amongst that is that you manage your focus. And I love, love, love that you 
go into the office knowing what it is that you're going to do first thing. And I wrote down a note, analog and di digital, because mm. I think that we could take the conversation off there in a minute. Um, the number of people who say to me, what system should I use? And sometimes I'm, I'm like a post-it note. You go into the office with your clear number one focus. You do not allow anything else to distract you. No going into the email and seeing what other people's other fires need to be put out. You just deliver on a thing. So thank you so much for sharing all of this. This is fantastic. Let's move into like this burning million dollar question. AI, is it really going to save us time? Your thoughts? It can be a massive time suck because you're forever trying to experiment with it and work out what's it going to do for me? And there's a new thing today and there's a new thing tomorrow. I mean, luckily my job is to stay up to date with that stuff. So I have to put time in my diary to learn about this. And that's, that's still a productive thing. However, it will save you time if you have a clear objective of what you want it to do and then use the right techniques for getting it to do that. So if I give you an example, for me, I looked at all the different things that I do. I looked at what my team did and then I worked out which of my tasks could I streamline? And there's, for me, there's three things. One is writing articles. Out of the box, ChatGPT is horrible at writing a decent length article. It's, it's no good at writing long form content. The solution is custom GPTs within ChatGPT. So for, for listeners that aren't familiar, custom GPT is kind of your version of, a, of ChatGPT that does a particular task. But the great thing about it is that you can do things like train it in tone of voice. First thing I did was go in, give it one of my books, like 80,000 words, and say, learn the tone of voice of this, this book. Write me a prompt, a detailed prompt that I can use in other prompts to define the tone of voice. So I gave it a load of my writing, and it wrote this kind of like three or four paragraph long thing that says here is a really detailed version of your tone of voice. So I've got that as a basis. And then within the GPT itself, I go in and say, right, you are an expert article writer that writes articles for digital marketers. So I give it a kind of role play. And then I give it a step of set by set instructions. So one, I'll give you a topic. Give me five possible topic lines, subject lines um, for that particular. And it will give me five options. And then I say, right, option two. OK, once you've I've selected an option go through and break down an article of around 3,000 words on that topic. And they must include examples and case studies, and a bit of detail on that. It will go down and give me a detailed breakdown. I then say, work through that step by step, giving me the opportunity to go through and edit, approve, um, go into more detail, that kind of stuff. So basically, I've forced it into a situation where it has to go through step by step, and it's helping me to draft something doing it in my tone of voice and giving me the first kind of cut at doing something. That for me is a massive time saver. Something that would take me right five or six hours is now taking me two hours to write. So it's it's still taking time because I'm still putting the, the effort into it, but it is doing it in a time efficient way and it's doing it in a high quality way. What we don't want to do is just pump out more and more rubbish content. So I think that would be an example for me where it is a massive time saver. Plus, it forces me to do it. See, writing is one of those things I'm good at procrastinating. I'll start and then I'll get drift off and I'll do something else and I'll do something else. And then suddenly I've written 500 words in a day and it's just a waste of time. So by doing this, it just kind of gives me a workflow that I have to kind of stick to. So I think that for that kind of stuff, it's great. I've used 11 labs for deep faking my own voice. So now I used to have to record lots of little updates for online learning in my voice and I don't need to do that anymore it can just be done in the deep fake version of me because it's completely convincing you wouldn't know the difference now that's quite a time time saver as well there are other things for the team like helping us to do first drafts of video edits and things like that um, it's okay I'm not sure it is saving a huge amount of time in the end because you end up redoing a lot of it anyway so I think it's it's good if you get it right but it can also just be like anything else it's just yet another tool and you can have all the writing tools in the world. doesn't mean you're going to write anything. It, it's still reliant on you having some sort of output. So I think on the balance for me, it works well. But I think if you're not careful, I've seen so many people just going down the rabbit hole trying to play with these tools and not inherently getting that much out of them because they haven't thought about why they're using what they want it to do and what the point of that would be. That is so, so helpful. And what I'm really hearing you say is that you need to know why you want it and then you need to work with it. Because I, I feel like the question that naturally comes up when somebody says, 
oh, I work with ChatGPT to write this article. Well, did you write the article? Did ChatGPT write the article? Uh, I, I don't want to read it if AI wrote it. And I would just love your thoughts on how the world is going to change. The world is already changing. And what um, what our skill set is going to become going forward? Because I, I don't feel like you can put the genie back in the bottle and say, no, chat GPT did, wrote, wrote this or didn't write this. And obviously you, you work with... Um, universities so I'm guess they're sort of seeing that students are using AI and is it wrong and is it cheating I mean this is a bit of a a, a debatable question even but I just love your thoughts on it so I mean first of all if we just look at the university thing the gut reaction for universities was to go oh I'd ban the students from using it and then you suddenly realize there is no way of doing that there's no way you're going to be able to actually stop them from doing it and realistically you wouldn't stop someone from using calculator because you know unless you're testing their mental arithmetic so it's a tool. So actually, as, as educators, our job is to work out what knowledge we're trying to test. And if it's literally just recall, then what's the point in that? We've got the internet for that. So I think you still need to learn how to write, because if you don't know how to write, then you won't be able to judge if something's well written. You need to have an, a level of expertise in the topic that if you get ChatGPT to help you write something, it has to be of a sufficient quality that you can look at it and go, yeah, that's good or that's not good. So actually, it's usually to someone if you don't really understand the topic. But what it made me realize is an educational perspective, what's important is critical thinking. It's the ability to look at a topic, break it down and, and so on. So I think we've we've identified from an academic point of view that it's just a tool. So you need to make sure the underlying skills are there to use it effectively. And you need to be realistic. Now, we also did some research at Imperial College looking at can you detect AI created content using AI? And the answer is you can't. It's once you get to a certain level, it's almost impossible to detect. Now, if I write something versus an AI writes it, is does that make any difference? Well, Google's answer was you absolutely must not use AI generated content on your website. And then suddenly about a year ago, they came out and said, oh, good content's good content. Don't care how it's generated. But in, in the background, they came up with this eat and eat, E-E-A-T, was... Um, experience, expertise, authoritativeness, and trust. And they're using it to judge if quality, the quality of content is any good or not. Well, it's things like, here's my experience of it. Here's an example of it. Here's a little video case study. So suddenly the AI can't do that. So you're kind of differentiating your content. You're linking through to the author. So therefore the author's got some sort of reputation and they can understand the connection between the author and the organization and the article. I know that a well-written article is a well-written article. And if I read a narrative that's really engaging and interesting, then that will still resonate, that will still work. Now, is AI capable of doing that? Uh, yes and no, to, to, to a lesser extent, yes. I mean, it, it can do some of that stuff. But if you look at what GPT stands for, generative, create something, pre-trained, based on other stuff, transformer just change that pre-trained stuff. It's just regurgitating other stuff and putting it out in a different way. But I would argue that's what the human brain does. That's how our neural networks work. So I, I don't think we should be afraid of this kind of written AI written content. All I would suggest is that generic AI written content isn't much use. It's not really adding a lot of value. And if it was, the world would just be awash with these books that were selling like, you know, selling best selling books, but uh, they're not really. It's good for helping and assisting, but it's not necessarily great for doing the best forms of writing where it gets a little bit interesting and i mean this in the, in the most positive terms is that if you look at something like mid journey so if you're not familiar mid journey is an ai image generation tool and the reason it's not as widely used as dali and things like that is that you have to go in and you have to discuss there's, there's a chat interface to use it basically and mid journey is fascinating because you can get it to generate images but you can see everyone else generating images and what their prompt has been and what that's ended up creating. And you can see it's an art form. There's an absolute art to working out how to get the very best from this new tool. So I think that's probably the best way of seeing it is that, you know, you, you don't just pick up Photoshop and go, well, Photoshop can do graphic design. Therefore, I am a graphic designer. You pick up Photoshop and go, I need a set of skills to be able to use that tool to do something decent with it. Like anyone can draw a circle with it. Creating a beautiful design is something else. I think it's the same to some extent 
with chat GPT, you need a whole set of skills to do something actually really good with it. Anyone can pick it up and draw a circle, i.e. anyone can pick up and make it write something. Doesn't mean what it's going to write is going to be any good. But I think we've just got some new tools and those tools can make us more efficient and they can potentially make us more effective, but they can easily create noise. And there's lots of ethical questions that we're going to need to answer. So if I've got an image generation tool and it generates a face that looks like you, but it's done by accident, is it okay to use that? If I've got a deep fake in my voice and I did this whole podcast in my deep fake, would that be okay? So there's that authenticity piece. And my, my favorite quote with this uh, was from Professor Celia Moore, who's our professor of ethics at Imperial College. She says, in situations like we've got now, we need to lean into our humanity. We need to kind of lean in to whatever it is that makes us human. So, you know, if I go and see you and you're speaking at an event, it's your story, it's your narrative, it's that history, it's all that kind of stuff that really makes it resonate with people. That's the reality. It's trying to work out what's the human aspect of it that we're trying to draw out in whatever piece of work we're creating, whether that's a podcast, a video, an article, what's the human bit? And that's what Google's trying to recreate with that eat thing. It's the experience, the expertise, the trust, the authoritiveness. Those are the things we can demonstrate through the human aspect of things. So, yeah, we can use these tools. Yeah, we can probably do things more efficiently. But still, it's that human aspect that's going to shine out and that's going to really differentiate and that makes you know a great article slightly different from something that's okay. It's really, really fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. You had me at the calculator. Um, and I think it's such an interesting thing to consider because I was educated at the time when calculators were coming in and there was the whole conversation of you shouldn't use them and you should know how to do it and blah, blah, blah. But I think to take the calculator analogy one step forward, if you were to tell me I could use Excel, but I couldn't use the sum and that I had to add up every single cell and it was a 2000 cell Excel spreadsheet, I'd, I'd, I'd say no. Technology is always useful and it's how you use it. So thank you so much for sharing that. Okay, I would love to know on your time management, on your business, on your life journey, what are some things that you do now with your time that you don't believe other people do with their time? What are you actively saying no to that you think people are saying yes to? I just love your thoughts on this because in this podcast, it is our entire objective to present possibilities, to present proof, to present um, potentiality. And I know that when I have these conversations with people, there are things. So I'd love your thoughts on that. What I've become comfortable with, which I was really not comfortable with before, is doing nothing. <laughs> so what I mean by that is that having time, and this is not necessarily during the working week, you might do this in your weekends, whatever it might be, but to say, well, what did you do on Saturday? And if I said, uh, I went for a walk, you know, people are like, oh, it doesn't sound like the most upgetting, you know, you hear about these, oh, it's amazing weekends of traveling to these places and going to these restaurants and to these bars and here's me on Instagram. And it's like, nope, not, not interested. I, first of all, the taking time to do nothing. Now that's probably going for a walk or going and sitting, having a coffee with a friend or whatever it might be, but being very comfortable with having a big block of time and actually not having anything planned in for that and being quite happy to stare out the window sounds ridiculous but to literally stare out the window I can be quite yeah and that's something I was desperately difficult to sit still I can't I normally really can't sit still trying to find the the discomfort in that and then actually engage with that a little bit and try and work out why is my brain racing why is it that I feel the need to do stuff all the time why is it is efficiency the end outcome it is from a work point of view but actually that can't be everything so I think that's one thing the other thing is I taking photos with no intention of them going anywhere right and this is this is going back to my youth and then kind of realizing that was that it had got to the point I think where because I travel a lot because I actually do quite a lot of what I think are interesting things and I, I stay in nice hotels all the time now I've got to that point in my career and um I'm flying business class and all that kind of stuff it's quite instagrammable right so it's quite easy to go oh, business class lounge and i'm in this hotel and it's gonna and i'm like i don't care when someone posts that stuff i know what they're trying to do i'm not really interested I'm actually i'm just gonna not post that stuff i'm not gonna post the stuff when i go that's super instagrammable i'm gonna stop doing it which sounds completely counterintuitive but the reason being is that i'm not enjoying it when i'm doing that 
And actually, that thing of being present, which kind of which is what connects it to the initial answer, is just trying to be a lot more present, enjoying the things that I am doing, and then not trying to see them from someone else's perspective. Now, it probably me- means, I mean, you, you only have to look at my Instagram to work this out, that I'm posting like once every six weeks now or something awful, like completely all the rules um, against what I should be doing. But I also then suddenly realized my Instagram is a really nice place. Those people that like my stuff are people that are really supportive of me. They're people that care. And if I go, I'm on holiday, they go, oh, good, I'm glad you're on holiday, not how flash is it? So it's, I found a bit of a balance with that and realized, what am I missing? Am I missing something? And I'm like, no, the the stuff that I'm missing out on that is building an audience that doesn't really care anyway. That was kind of part of it. And where that came from was from doing the podcast and on the podcast, us being really honest about all the things we screwed up all the time. So if I've our podcast being about, this is how you do great digital marketing. It's like, how did you get with that campaign? It was a disaster. Oh, wow. Why? And it's like, what I did learn was this. I sh- I'll never do that again. OK, cool. So that kind of warts and all approach tended to to be a little bit more authentic with our audience. But it actually allowed me to let go of some stuff. So I think giving yourself time to think is is really important and not undervaluing that. Um, blocking in time to do nothing is really important because I think you could be too efficient in that you are constantly trying to you know if if the amount of volume of output is what i'm judging myself on there's always more i could do actually saying if chat gpt is going to help me automate some of this stuff i have to have some of the creative thinking in the first place to be able to feed into that so giving myself the space to to kind of do that and and seeing the kind of value in it and that's led to some some shifts elsewhere in terms of stopping caring about things i still have awful fomo with my social media streams of kind of, I should have taken a picture of that. That, that would have been really good. But actually, for, for what I gained from losing that a little bit, that I don't even try anymore, it's actually been pretty good. And occasionally there'll be just an opportune moment where we get a picture and go, oh, that's kind of that's kind of great. So I think that's that space, um, giving myself the time to do that is maybe counterintuitive, but it seems to work. These are all such fantastic tips. I'm loving them. I would like to explore the one of um documenting your life and almost the anti-document from the point of view that you are so knowledgeable in the world of social media and how it's all changing and that five or six years ago it was the thing to document everything um to, to the degree where some of it you know was showing off not showing off but I would just love to explore your your thoughts and perhaps even your predictions because this whole anti documentation seems to be a thing and I have also noticed myself like my Instagram account got hacked 2 years ago and I haven't been building it to the same level that it was before I don't constantly post I don't constantly talk about all of the things that I'm doing. So I'd just love your thoughts on it, what you're noticing in the industry from your clients and where you really believe that social media is actually going. I probably take more photos now than I ever do before, but they're not for social, they're for me and my family. So it is, and that that comes from having kids, having dogs and to seeing how quickly they they grow and age and I've aged and, and just wanting the nostalgia of looking back on that and actually having some little time to sit back and go oh look that was a nice time I remember that that was a nice holiday and I'd kind of got to the point I was so cynical of the whole social media thing that I'd stopped taking pictures of my own pleasure that was the shift that was the kind of shift the the general thing is I interestingly I follow a couple of people on social media that I just know from being you know, around my life not particularly industry people and a couple of them document their lives in great detail and I really enjoy it, right? Like, so it's, there's a particular family, they go, we went to this place, we went here, that was quite interesting. And it's literally just what they did, in the, but they're describing what they liked about it. And I care about them. And therefore, I find that interesting. I, I don't think necessarily the documenting thing is a problem. I think it's more just the overly curated, trying a bit too hard, fake influencer thing. I think it's so hard now to grow a following that, kind of way you'll get the odd person that does it incredibly well but I think it's such a difficult thing to do now I look at my students at Imperial College and there are lots of them that have built really big social media followers followings but it's sadly because they're beautiful or they're wealthy 
And actually it makes, it works just naturally for them because they're taking the, these pictures of their incredibly glamorous life. It's because their life is pretty glamorous. And actually that, you know, that's that's beautiful. But the, the mental health impact that that has on everyone else is, is huge. I think there has to be a bit of a conscious decision about this. Personal branding, what do I stand for as a brand? And if all you're going to stand for is to be, you know, wealthy and beautiful, well, there's always going to be someone richer than you and there's always going to be someone more beautiful than you. So therefore, it's it's, always, it's just going to be hard. So I think the way the industry seems to have shifted, there's plenty of that still going on. There's a huge level of cynicism towards it because of the fact there's so many fake accounts and fake followers and, and all those kind of things. I think where it's at is authenticity, which is why I think that actually why TikTok has done so well is that you can have a view from, from every different angle um in the you know the niche stuff is what really works on tiktok because you can find the audience where your reality is is interesting authenticity has to be lived it can't be so i'm going to be authentic and therefore i'm only going to do this from now on it's really about working out what you stand for as a brand and what value you're providing so i think if you go back to the principles of marketing who's the target audience what's their problem how can i help them address that problem how can i provide value i think it's maybe simpler now i don't need to be bombarding them across all the social media channels now actually if LinkedIn's hitting the spot, I'm just going to do that. We're a B2B brand. And when I looked at our social metrics, I've been kind of lying to myself for years because I knew 90% of it was doing nothing. But it felt like we had to chase it. We had to chase it. We had to be seen to be doing it. And then one day we were like, do you know what? Let's just can it. Let's just can everything apart from LinkedIn because that's what's really, really working for us. And then I'll use Instagram for people that I connect to in the real world. So my students, people that come on training courses, and it will be me and that's it. And that's actually been way more effective it was less overwhelming i think from a, a, a kind of thought process and actually also it's we're just doing the stuff that works so we, we don't have to spend hours doing the stuff that may or may not work I, I do feel the pressure for other people though in that you're desperately trying to build something and it just doesn't get any traction and it's exhausting and i, and I think it's it's just because we're trying to do the same as other people and then if we work out what's just slightly different what's our thing that's what makes the difference have your intention and to know your numbers and know what is actually and it comes back to what you said earlier what's actually moving the needle and the fact that the world's moved on that we don't need to be on 16 different social media platforms keeping up with all of the different messaging it's really just being the honey pot where, where the honey is in essence yeah and i i would also say with that it's that thousand true fans kind of idea is that if you're trying to chase a million followers it's exhausting right and you kind of feel like you're never going to get there there's always someone that's got ten thousand more followers than you whereas actually if you go one at a time i'm going to try and build up a thousand true fans and i think me meeting you is a lovely example of this like i i met you at the conference i hadn't heard your work before i hadn't read your stuff all those kind of things and then i started following you in social media when i see your social media I like it because it's you, right? And I know Abigail and therefore that I'm totally connected to that now. So I think that's the difference is that if I can build that authentic connection, whereas I actually, whether I do that face-to-face -face or, or you know, online, if I feel actually connected to someone, when they post something, it resonates in a completely different way. And I think that's what I've realized is that if you can get it to resonate in the right way, then it's far more meaningful. And, you know, a thousand followers that have got some meaning as opposed to 20,000 who've never even heard of you and don't really care, different thing altogether. Yeah, I love that. And the very, very simple, and again, it comes back to the numbers, is you could have a million followers, but what's your revenue through that? If you have a thousand true fans and they actually love you, resonate with it and are there because they want to, that could make the money. And this is... In, in essence, people want attention, but they also want the money and they want the success. And each of these different steps, it's like there are steps to it. And sometimes the, the thing, the rabbit that you think you're chasing isn't the one that's going to get you the result. And I, I really feel like we could take this conversation on and on and on, but I'm just conscious of time. What have you got coming up this year and where can we find out more about you and the work that you do? for us this year is all about scaling so what we've been doing is investing a lot of time into the building blocks so if i give you the real quick history of it we built the target internet platform this online learning platform and we kind of as i said we we kind of bootstrapped it and then we got to this point where we'd fix something and it would break something else and we'd fix that and it would break something else but this horrible technical debt and we had to make this horrible decision that we are going to rebuild everything we've done over the last 10 years from scratch over an 18 month period which means we'll make no progress during that period, 
but we'll have a product business everything at the end of it that is completely then built beautifully scalable changeable all that kind of stuff so we went through that we rebranded because the brand was getting quite tired as well um we updated we got new offices we we put a, a big investment into doing the video podcast loads of other things like that and now we put sales processes and process mapping was the key thing for us so everything is now mapped and process orientated all done for a really strong crm system so that now we can scale up those processes so that's that's us next year so it's really growing that size of our community and we've got the capability to do that now um if people want to learn more about what i do so we want the podcast all the tools that we use all that kind of stuff um targetinternet.com go forward to the resource section and there's just a ton of free resources in there and you can download all that kind of stuff and the toolkits and the podcast and the videos and everything else and nobody ever needs to panic because, you know, I always put all of the links in the show notes. Everything is there for you so that we make it so easy peasy. As we wrap this conversation up, is there anything I haven't asked you that you would have liked to have been asked that you would like to talk about today? And there's no reason why we can't have you back on again to continue the conversation. It's been an enlightening conversation for me, actually, because it's made me quantize a few of the things that I've been thinking around how we use social media differently. And I think it all kind of ties together about, you know, using your time efficiently, being authentic, actually hitting those thousand true fans. It's all about effectiveness, but really taking that step back. And actually, if you can take the step back and work out, what do I really want from this? Why? Why do I want that? that then you start to answer your own questions and you can find ways of achieving those things. In that answer and other answers that you've shared is really around knowing yourself. And it's almost an ego conversation about are you doing it for your ego and who are you trying to impress? And um, in essence, this is our one life. It is a one way ticket. We are not getting a refund on any of this. We don't get a do over. So it's super duper important that we make the most of our time. So Daniel Rouse, thank you so much for your time. It has been a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thanks so much, Abigail. It's been a real pleasure. And until next time, my friends, stay safe, stay well, and remember, it's your time. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. If you loved what you heard, be sure to let me know by leaving a review so I can keep the good stuff coming. Come and say hi on Instagram at Success by Design Training or visit my website, successbydesigntraining.com or connect with me on LinkedIn. Just search Abigail Barnes. Until next time, don't forget, you are amazing and it's your time.